Welcome to the Smarter Trading Podcast. If you want to sharpen your trading skills or become a more savvy investor, then you're in the right place. Every week, we sit down with professional traders who are ready to share practical insights on what it takes to succeed in modern day markets. Smarter Trading, the show to watch to trade smarter. Medeiros is the founder and CEO of The Trade Risk. All opinions expressed by guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Evan or The Trade Risk. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Evan and guests may maintain positions in securities discussed in this podcast. This episode of Smarter Trading is sponsored by Investors Business Daily. IBD has been around for over 35 years, helping investors navigate each and every market cycle. If you want the best analysis and actionable trade ideas from the leader in growth investing, check out IBD Digital. Go to investors.com slash Evan, that's E-V-A-N, to get your first two months for only $20. Subscribe today and start trading smarter at investors.com slash Evan. Thank you, IBD, for supporting financial education and making this episode possible. Now, let's get on with the show. Our guest today is Cesar Alvarez. From 2004 to 2013, Cesar was the Director of Trading Strategies at TradingMarkets.com and Connors Research. Cesar has developed strategies for private equity funds, authored multiple books on trading, and was a software engineer for the early versions of Microsoft Excel. He is well known in the quant community nowadays for his blog, Alvarez Quant Trading. In this episode, we talk about what it means to be a systems trader, why Cesar willingly leaves money on the table in order to be fully systematic, and why it's so important for traders' personalities to match their trading strategies. We then get into Cesar's research process, how he finds ideas, develops systems, and then maintains and reviews those systems. Please enjoy this episode with professional trader Cesar Alvarez. I am super excited to talk with you today because you and I have chatted a good deal about markets over the past few years together, but I haven't had sort of the the privilege to dig into your background a little bit further and kind of how you got here because it is very interesting. And so I would love to just hear kind of how you got to where you are today and just a little bit more about your background. Sure. Uh, first of all, Evan, thanks for uh, having me here. It's always great to talk to you about the markets. I just love talking about the markets with anybody and especially you. Unfortunately, we haven't seen each other in face to face in our uh, monthly uh, stock market meetings. Hopefully those will get started up in, in our, yeah. uh, next year, I guess. All right. So a little bit of my background. So uh, in the late 90s, I was really getting interested in the stock market. Uh, in particular, I was doing what we call discretionary trading. I probably did the typical arc that most traders do, uh, you know, they started with mutual funds and started looking into stocks, started doing discretionary trading, uh, was getting into the whole, um, if you're, you're old enough, the old um, William O'Neill can slim method. So, you know, really got into that perfect timing in the late 90s. So 98, 99, for those of you who remember those years, it was easy to make lots and lots of money buying new highs, a little bit like today, I think, uh, but not as crazy as then. So that's why, you know, I really got into that. Uh, of course, in 2000, we had the bear market. Um, around that time, I discovered AmiBroker. And this is where now I started looking and understand, hey, there's a quantitative side. I can start modeling the things. And after, you know, for the first couple of years, it was like no success. And then I, I took a class by Larry Connors. Uh, Larry Connors uh, used to run, or still does, runs TradingMarkets.com. It used to be then TradeHard.com. But so I you know, took a class from him and he really uh, opened my eyes to very much better systemized methods, in particular mean reversion, uh, something I had not been looking at before. And you know, that uh, really at that point resonated with me. So um, after taking his class and after bugging him for a year and a half, he finally gave me a job working for him. Uh, and then I spent nine years uh, being the director of research with uh, Larry Connors. Uh, at that time, I really got ingrained in the whole mean reversion is the way to go. And, you know, it was the way to go back then, definitely. Um, the mid-2000s, there was a great mean reversion years. Um, I miss those years. Of my trading buddy and I sometimes joke about, man, remember when we used to talk and we used to make 10% a day on a stock? No problem. You know, and you know, we complained when those weren't happening every other day. 
Uh, well, volatility was much better then, and uh, mean reversion was much less um, known then. Uh, in 2013, 2000, oh God, when did I leave? 2013, yeah, 2013, I decided to leave Larry Connors because I wanted to go out on my own. I wanted to start writing a blog, uh, you know, Alvarez Quant Trading, which uh, hopefully some of your um, listeners are aware of, and also wanted to start uh, consulting with um, individual clients. Uh, I really like writing code, talking with other traders, and this also opened me up. So that's what I've been doing for the last, uh, since that time frame. Uh, during this time frame, though, I've definitely expanded my trading. You know, as much as I'm still known as mean reversion, everybody comes to me even now and says, hey, you're the mean reversion expert. I now trade, you know, trend following, breakout, momentum, uh, volatility based. So, you know, I've definitely expanded what I trade, even though, like I said, most people know me as the mean reversion guy. And hopefully soon, uh, I've been working on a crypto uh a cryptocurrency uh, strategy that hopefully in a month or two I'll start trading and you know expand myself even a little bit more then. Uh, so yeah, that's a quick background uh, on that. And any questions on that? Yeah, I mean, so I love the background, and I know that you did spend you know what nine years now with 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 uh, Larry Connors uh, as the director of research. But what does what what does a director of research do? Like, what was your day to day back then? Like, what were you two sort of uh, looking at back in those early right. days? Yeah. So back in those early days, um, you know, it was often me and anywhere from I'd say one to three other researchers. You know, so that I'd be leading. Um, often, Larry is an incredible wealth of ideas. I mean, I'm always amazed even now about the amount of ideas he would throw at us, you know, it'd be each morning, it seemed like I'd come in and you have three new ideas that you want to test it out. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, he, he would give us so much ideas and that's what we do. We'd go through and test those ideas. And then you know, after testing his ideas, we'd go, okay, the idea works or doesn't work, but can we make it better? You know, if it, if it works, can we make, you know, I would like kind of lead trying to make it better. If it didn't work, it's like, okay, can we make it work by tweaking it somehow? So those were the main things that, we would focus on the day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, amongst other things, he would run a lot of uh, educational uh, thing or run courses, put on courses. So I would, you know, we'd be producing uh, courses and uh, helping them with that. Also, he yes. had a, a trading club at that point uh, that I was a member of and helped with that. So those took up a lot of time. And surprisingly, the drudgery work of keeping data <laughs> correct and up to date, uh, things are much better nowadays compared to back then. Uh, Back then, I had to by hand keep track of the S&P 500 historical constituents. And trust me, that is painful. It was not my favorite thing to do each month, um, but it gave us a definite advantage back then. Uh, so yes, so that gives you a little bit more idea of what my typical uh, things were then. Yeah, that um, yeah, that data, which which you know, thank God I I came across you, met you, and and started to connect with you on the whole system side of the market and your, you know, your, your expressed concern over data and how much work it can be to get clean, good, reliable data is just so important. And um, yeah, we take it for granted now, but I'm sure it was a <laughs> full team's job back in the day to actually, yeah. you know, maintain that type of stuff. Yeah. And it's really funny because I'm now I'm re-seeing that as I'm trying to develop strategies on the crypto market, it's back yeah. to, survivorship bias you don't have that much data and you know it's like oh i, I thought i got rid of these issues and trying to find a good crypto data source it's, it's just like ah here we are going all over again <laughs> yeah well luckily you've gone down that path once so um hopefully it won't be as hard this the second time around right. um so so you mentioned that you did some discretionary trading and i'm just curious um how long how how long did it take you to, to to sort of move on from that or what was sort of the you know was there an event or something that you said nope not going to do this myself like i need to get some code and and look at some you know historical market data to make these decisions was was there anything that you could point to back then uh, i mean it, it, it says a couple of events first of all it's a, the realization that my discretionary trading in the 98 98 or 97 to 99 time frame was purely 
I was making money because the markets were just going up. It was like, you know, I buy yeah. something making me, you know, it wasn't my discretionary trading that was making me money nor my skills of reading the market. And then when I found Larry and his, you know, very systematic rules and started testing those rules, that just connected with me. I mean, I've got a computer pro program background and, you know, uh, did engineering major in college. So that all clicked to me. And it's the usual thing that clicks with us engineers and computer science people is this, this, this systematic trading. Um, and I also realized, you know, a lot of people think, I mean, I thought this early on, that's like, oh, I can go systematic trading. I can get emotions completely out of the equation. Well, the emotions are still there. They're just, I think they're a little bit easier to deal with potentially, or there's different emotions to deal with. So it was kind of those two events, realizing that A, I wasn't that great of a discretionary trader, and B, realizing, hey, this whole systematic approach fits me better. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's the important part about trading is trying to make sure you find a strategy that matches your personality. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. It's funny because it just makes me think about 10 minutes ago when we jumped on this call. And one of the first things I said to you was, boy, what a day in the markets today. And then you looked at me and said, was it? Because I didn't even look yet. <laughs> and yeah. so it, it goes to show, you know, how you know, you can, you can, you can sort of remove that emotion again, not all of it, but you can certainly distance yourself from the heat of the action by, you know, going right. down the fully rules-based sort of approach. Um, before we leave on uh, the, the Larry Connors and your work as a director of research, you did author a number of books. You know, so, I, you know, when I was doing a little digging on you, of course, I knew you had a one or two, I thought, but you actually have more than that. Is it, how many do you have altogether that you've uh, co-authored? Well, I, I don't know because it eventually gets to <laughs> what's your definition of book. I mean, we have probably. Let me look back here. Do I have all out? One, two. I don't know. I think four or five books with him, and then lots yeah. of what I call mini books uh, that are where you know you can't really get on Amazon kind of thing. So gotcha. yeah, there's quite a few books that we did along the way too. I, you know, I've forgotten about that. Uh, you know, those are also projects in themselves. Uh, because really, I mean, always the big fear as a researcher who's putting out information out to the public is yeah. um, putting out, making a mistake and putting out bad day, you know, bad results. And, you know, the books we did lots of scrubbing to make sure that there were no, you know, coding mistakes, data mistakes and things like that. Those are definitely big headaches on, on that uh, front. We'll put uh, we'll put all those books um, in the show notes for this episode. That way people can check them out. Um, so let's move on to a little bit about kind of your your current day investing approach. So so why don't you make the pitch here on sort of what is your what does your day to day look like? What's your overall philosophy now on kind of how you trade markets? Right. So my current philosophy. So first of all, I'm still uh, I trade primarily U.S. stocks and ETFs. I mean that is the bread and butter of what I trade. Um, I'm trying to expand on that, going to the crypto side, uh, but ignoring that right now, it is purely that. Uh, I I believe in you know trading multiple different types of strategies. So I like I said, I trade a mean reversion strategy, a breakout strategy, a momentum strategy. I just you know trade a variety of strategies. And also believe in expanding across time, meaning I have a strategy that typically holds a couple of days, another strategy holds a couple of weeks, and another one that holds you know, a month or two. So I also trade across those. Now, something I was just talking with a client the other day is during bull markets, they are mostly uncorrelated. But everybody, everybody you got to remember, though, during bear markets like you know, or March of 2020, everything goes correlated. If you're in the stock market, everything goes correlated down to one, no matter what you are. Uh, so that is you know, an unfortunate part of being only in the U.S. markets. But that is my that's what I'm trading now on a day to day basis. Uh, so every night I run through, you know, because I am what I call semi automated. My trading each night takes five minutes, if that. It's usually a couple of button clicks and then, you know, see, making sure everything goes along the way. Uh, I like to be involved in the process. Um, being a computer programmer, I'm too scared to give the computer full control. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's like, let me just click on buttons and just say, yeah, everything looking fine. And, you know, on a rare occasion, every couple of months, it's like, Hey, what the hell just happened here? I need to figure out what's going on before I mm -hmm. get into trouble. So yeah, that is my, you know, that's one of the nice things about, um, being fully systematic is my evenings are, or my trading is very limited. You know, people are always surprised that when I tell them, oh, yeah, my trading has five minutes. You know, what do you do my rest of the day? Well, I spend time researching, uh, you know, I'm researching for new strategies, researching for my blog, 
researching for my membership site, um, writing, you know, writing blog articles, working with traders, consulting with traders. So that's, that's what takes up most of my time. Uh, and that's, you know, I love doing that stuff. So, you know, you've been looking at markets, researching markets now for, for, for 20 years plus, um, the cynic in me might look at sort of this fully rules-based approach and say, well, you know, darn, you, you, you've had to accumulate some type of, of gut feel or intuitive knowledge that you might be able to support your system or you might be able to, you know, help in your systematic sort of trading. I mean, is there, you know, why, why not try and, you know, tinker a little bit or try and put in some of your own discretion in there? Like, is there, um, you know, anything specific that you want to point to? Right. So as always, there's multiple ways of making money in the market. And um, I know by being 100% systematic, I am probably leaving money on the table. And here's why. Uh, my trading buddy, uh, he is what I would call a discretionary quant. So he takes all, we trade very similar strategies, or he basically trades almost the same strategies I trade. He has the rules for them. But he puts his discretion, he sees the signals and he puts his discretionary of, ooh, maybe I should take a bigger size, smaller size, maybe I should skip this. And he gets much better results than I do. And I see this all the time. Now, why don't I try to do that? Yeah, I get that gut feel, but there's a couple of reasons. First, um, it also requires following the markets a lot more during the day. You know, he follows them much more to keep that intuitive feel, to understand it. And second of all, I'm comfortable where I am. You know, it's like, okay, I don't need, yeah, would I like better returns? We all love better returns, but I also like the compromise I'm getting is by having more free time to do other things like research and, you know, because I know. I'm always doing research because strategies die, whether it's going to die tomorrow, a year from now, five years from now, or 10 years from now, they will die and they will need to be replaced. So I'm always looking for that. And that's where I think, I think my edge is in finding the strategies, not trying to eke out or not eke out, but improve my current ones. Um, so that's kind of the reason why I, I, I stay on the fully uh, quantitative side or systematic side. Uh, like, but I said, like I said, my friend, uh, my trading buddy, he, he does the discretionary on our trades and I'm always amazed on how well, you know, how well of a gut feel he has. And I have a similar gut feel, but I, his is much better than mine and he knows how to execute much better. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the, the clarity in sort of understanding ultimately what you want to, I mean, the fact, like you said earlier that you can trade the market with a few clicks of a button, five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, something like that. I mean, that is, I mean, that's just empowering to be able to do that and not have to stare at the screen for six hours. And um, yeah, I think it's all a decision that I think we ultimately have to make for, for ourselves, right? On how, how active you want to be and how involved you want to get. Right. And it's a matter of what you enjoy. I'm like I said, yeah. I don't enjoy staring at the screen and looking at, right. you know, stock charts or stock charts kind of thing. That's just not my enjoyment. My enjoyment is on the research side. Yeah. And, you know, that's where I focus my energy on. You know, even though, you know, I trade 10 minutes a day, it's, I spend hours a day doing sure. research. So it's not like, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, okay. You know, research is part of trading for me. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of people would consider that, oh, you could spend 10, day, 10 minutes a day, spend the rest of the day on the beach. No, yeah. not quite. <laughs> <laughs> really phoning it in over there. Um, yes. Yeah. Nice. Um, no, that is uh, that is a great point. So I do want to I do want to dig into some strategy specific uh, questions and insights. But before that, I actually you know want to touch on a couple of research pieces that you've published on your blog. So your blog is awesome for all types of insights, discretionary traders or quants on just understanding markets and different dynamics. And you publish lots of different ideas there. So I want to touch on two of them. And one of them, the first one is actually pretty darn timely because we're recording this September 20th. And I think we just got our 5% pullback what, in the market. I think so. I think oh, we did. Crap. I just tweeted that we hadn't had one today, here today. This morning, <laughs> I think uh, I think we got there. If I look, oh, crap. Um... <laughs> I need to check. Oh man, that was a perfectly timed tweet. Oh man, yeah, it is. It is perfectly timed because yeah, I, I think we got it. If not, pretty darn close. But you basically, I'll have to take a look afterwards. 
<laughs> you put out this uh, research piece, or you set out to ask the question, you know, how often does a, a 5% pullback in the market turn into a 10% pullback and then even going to a quote unquote bear market 20% pullback? How often do those events oh. occur? And so I'd love for you to maybe just kind of talk through this, this research piece and, and kind of what you found when you did it. Right. This, uh, this research piece came from uh, a discussion my trading buddy and I were, were having is more of, you know, how often, you know, do markets sell off? You know, how, you know, people always worry at a 5% sell off or a 10% sell off. And it's like, you know, how often can we expect that? So I was curious, it's like, okay, starting from the beginning of the year and going you know, and just going through how often do we get a 5% sell off from the beginning of the year? And that's where this research piece came about. It's just understanding, you know, are these often occurrences or 10%? More importantly, it's like, okay, does 10% happen that often? Um, I was actually kind of surprised that the 5% sell-offs didn't happen as often as I would expect. They only happen on average uh, uh, 1.6 times a year. So, you know, every year you basically can expect one. I was expecting that number to be maybe two or three times a year would happen. So that was uh, quite surprising to me. And we, I did the data back to, I think, 1920-something. I forgot. Uh, 1929 is what I did, did the research back to. So I was really quite surprised that it's, um, it just does not happen, you know, happening more than uh, three or more times is not a frequent event. Yeah. So that, that, first of all, caught me surprising is how strong bull markets we, we tend to be in most of the time. Uh, and then I just thought, well, 5% happens that not that much. How often does ten percent happen? And that was also like almost only every other year can you expect a ten percent or more drawdown from the beginning of the year. Uh, again, quite surprising. Um, but you know, it also tells you okay when these happen, it's not something to worry about too bad. Uh, the next step of research I did was saying, well, once we've gotten this far, once we hit the ten percent uh, drawdown, how lucky are we to get to a twenty percent drawdown? And again. And I have to look back at my post to get the exact number on that one, 10%. Yeah, so you know, only you know, a little under half of the time does a 10% drawdown become a 20% drawdown from the beginning of the year. So again, not very frequent. So every other year we have a 10% drawdown and only half of the time does that go all the way up to at least a 20% drawdown. So a lot of this was trying to understand how, how often does this happen? How often should we start to worry in the markets you know, when, when that happens? So I like this piece because this is, like you said, I mean, this is something now that can give us some stats behind these occurrences. So again, for today's example, if, you know, S&P down 5%, well, we should expect that almost twice a year. Like that's, that's par for the course. That's what we get. If we want to invest in equities, you you have to expect some of that volatility. Um, But I guess the larger kind of question or if I'm sort of reading in between the lines here, I mean, these types of research pieces that you do, I mean, this, this ultimately could lead into a trade thesis or strategy itself, right? I mean, if you had enough convincing data here, if we said, wow, 95% of the time when there's a 5% drawdown, it goes to 10%, that, that could in fact turn into something. Is that, is that how you kind of view these types of pieces? Uh, This, this, this type of research was more wasn't in a sense to be generating uh, generating a strategy, but more to deal with the emotional side of trading. Gotcha. Uh, okay, when this happens, should I be prepared to go on? You know, is this something I need to worry about? You know, even though I am fully systematic, I still have to deal with the emotions of oh, I want to stop trading because the markets look bad. Um, yeah. And you know, I've gotten pretty good about ignoring that overall. I know there, there's a lot of people that are still like, oh, should I be worried? Should I not be worried? And this kind of says, look, 5%, it happens every year. Don't panic yet. Or, gotcha. you know, or, you know here's, your, here's the expectations to set up. Um, gotcha. of, you know, we've reached 10%. Just because we've gone down 10% doesn't mean we're going down 20% kind of thing. It's more gotcha. trying to set up expectations for understanding, okay, you know, this is possible now that, now that this happened. You know, there's 50% chance it, it continues down. You know, 50% chance it doesn't. Um, but again, so it's a lot of it is just setting up, trying to set up context of whether one should be worried or not worried and things like that. It's not nece- that research was not necessarily meant as a, OK, let me see if I can make a strategy out of this, mostly because it just doesn't happen enough. Um, doesn't happen enough to kind of say, OK, you know, at five percent, that's only once or twice a year kind of thing. So it's not right. enough in my book to say, OK, yeah, 
let me see if I can make a full strategy around this. Gotcha. Yep. Sample size and uh, number of occurrences, probably something we'll talk about a little bit later. So that, 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 thanks for that explanation. That makes sense. So if we look at another piece that you put out, um, you had a blog post that was looking at trend and momentum strategies. And you sort of compared, I think the, the 10 month moving average on the trend side versus a 10 month absolute return on the momentum side and you sort of, you know, simulated some results. So maybe kind of talk us through that research piece and kind of what you found with that one. Yeah. So that was an interesting one. That one um, came about mostly because uh, um, Gary Anatachi's research on dual momentum, you know, he uses both of this concept of trend following and momentum. And I just wanted to tease apart the two of, you know, is momentum better off? more often? Is trend following better more often? And how often are they actually better than just regular buy and hold? Um, so that's kind of where that was, um, I was, that research was going for me. And part of that was I have, um, so I have my, my trade or my stock market exposures is got two bins. One's my trading bin and one's my long-term bin kind of thing as my, my IRA kind of thing, my okay. retirement fund. So my retirement fund, I do a dual momentum like approach. Like I just call it that way. It's, it's conceptually it's using that idea. So this mm -hmm. was part of me trying to understand, you know, what part is giving, what, what part is, is helping? Are they both helping? Are they not helping? How's it do to buy and hold? And this was good because it was very clear. It wasn't clear. It was clear that neither one was clearly better. That was <laughs> the nice thing I found. It's like, well, depending on the situation, depending a little bit on the length, depending on the instrument, one might be better than the other, um, which, for me was actually a good thing to see. It was like, okay, this whole idea of dual momentum is to kind of say, you don't know which indicator is going to be working better. So you're kind of taking the advantage of both of them. Um, mm. Something that they both tend to be, they both tend to be better than buy and hold, especially when you care, um, when you care about drawdowns. And that's something at this point in my trading life, I care about drawdowns, um, less about returns. Uh, so, you know, that was also really good to see. Yeah, I, I think that's, I, I like this piece because of what you just said to, to show that trend and momentum both sort of have their their place in in acting as a, as a good uh, regime filter or, or, yes. or signal. But I also like that this post is, to me, it's a good sort of almost introductory into kind of the systematic trading landscape. I mean, for someone that maybe doesn't have a whole lot of coding experience or, or, you know, doesn't have the data to get their hands on. This is just a conceptually easy um, example of, yes. of a framework that someone could just say 10 month moving average. You could look at this by hand really, or you could go back on a charting platform and you could look at a 10 month, you know, moving average buy sell. And that's what I think is so cool about it. Um, and it sort of leads leads me to the question of what is your hurdle for for using a trading system? So um, when I'm developing a strategy, I usually start with a goal of either return of returns and drawdowns. So okay. you know, I may start with a strategy saying, "Hey, it may be as little as ten percent a year." You know, which yep. most people go, "Oh my god, that little." Um, and sometimes it may be as high as, you know, 25% a year. It really, part of it depends on what my goal for that strategy is. I'm not, I'm not usually just randomly looking for strategies. I'm usually like, okay, I'm looking for a strategy to fill this niche, you know. Um, so I'm usually trying to fill some niche or trying to improve on whatever I currently have. It's like, oh, I'm looking for a strategy that's going to replace this current strategy. So it needs to have better overall returns or drawdowns or, you know, it may be, it may be I'm trying to replace a strategy because the drawdowns are too high and I want lower drawdowns. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, okay, the strategy is not performing as well. It's not bad yet, but I want to now improve on it by doing that. So it's a little bit complicated. It's not, I can say, oh yeah, my cutoff numbers are X, Y, and Z. Sure, because sure. I always go in with, here's what I want. And then, okay, let me see if I can get that. And a lot of it is also dependent on, you know, what am I trading? Am I trading ETFs? Am I trading small cap stocks? Am I trading NASDAQ stocks? S&P 500 stocks, and that also influences, you know, you're not going to get 25% a year probably trading ETFs. 
Um, right. Yeah, and you're not going to get single digit drawdowns trading small cap stocks kind of thing. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of that too. It's like understanding what I'm starting with because usually I start with a with a goal, you know, with annual returns or drawdown and a universe, and from there I build the strategy towards you know what I'm going for. Yeah, I mean I've seen that in even my own trading where when I was building my first sort of uh, fully rules based trading system the the, the slate was clean and I could just kind of come in and, and build this first system and I was happy with it. And then, you know, you build another system and then you're going to pair it with the first one. But now as you start to move along from those two, it's like, okay, well, it needs to be different enough. It needs yes. to either, you know, improve returns or it's got to be adding something to the mix. And so it gets yes. almost like progressively harder to like get those incremental new systems. It does get progressively harder because you just, I don't know. I trade a mean reversion strategy right now. I don't want to build another mean reversion strategy because they'll right. have the correlation all the yeah. time will be near one. So it's, it's always, like you said, each trade that you add, you really want to be different from all the other ones, you know, uh, as much as possible. Now they're going to be, like I said, they'll be correlated when the market crashes. But overall, you still tr you're trying to build them, make them different and things like that. And then, like you said, each one gets a little bit harder to add. And we will be right back. Those of you who know Trade Risk know we are all about rules-based investing, and that's why we are so excited to have Investor's Business Daily as a podcast sponsor. It's almost impossible to avoid boom and bust trading cycles unless you've got a system that works and you're able to stick with it. That's where IBD comes in. They've been helping investors navigate market cycles with their time-tested methodology for over 35 years, which is why you need to check out IBD Digital, their subscription service that gives you access to proprietary market analysis and top trade ideas. Start with the big picture to get a pulse on the market environment, then browse their exclusive stock lists like the IBD 50. Finally, use their stock checkup tool to find out more about a company. All of this is available to IBD Digital subscribers, and right now podcast listeners can get their first two months for only $20. Go to Investors.com slash Evan, that's Investors.com slash E-V-A-N, to get started for only $20. Now, back to the show. Do you have a, a classification of systems? Like, how do you think about it? You talk about mean reversion, you talk about momentum, any other, like, broad categories you think about when you're building yeah, systems? Yeah, so uh, I think about also like breakout would mm. be kind of, I, I view breakout momentum slightly differently. Okay. Uh, and also even trend following. Trend following, even though they're, they're all kind of upward kind of thing, very different from mean reversion, but I still view them subtly different on their setups and how they get in and how they potentially exit. So that those are my, you know, I'd, yeah, I'd say mean reversion, Breakout, momentum, and trend following. Oh, and then rotational, which can mm. be very, it can be very momentum-like, but also yep. rotational would be like kind of the fifth thing I do. How do you actually distinguish between so trend following, momentum? I get that distinction. What's the distinction you make between breakout and momentum? I guess breakout tends to be a narrow case of momentum. So breakout okay. for me normally is something that's just making a new high, whether it be a one-year high, all-time high, something like that. That is a key component of that versus momentum is usually something just is going up like crazy recently and it doesn't gotcha. need to be making some new type of high. Gotcha. Yep. That, that makes, that makes sense. I can see that distinction for sure. And then in terms of the rotational strategy, definitely I've seen lots of rotational strategies on ETFs and assets. Do you also think about that in terms of individual stocks as well? Stock, stock portfolio rotational? Yep, you do. Yep. I have uh, one I'm trading now uh, that's doing uh, quite well. Or at least was. I have no idea why it probably got killed today. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, I have a weekly rotational strategy and a monthly rotational strategy that I'm trading. Um, gotcha. And, you know, one of them, I would say it's rotational momentum. The other one I would call rotational trend following kind of thing. Gotcha. And so, and then when we use the term, just so everybody understands rotational, typically, if I understand it correctly, we have some type of ranking mechanism that is ranking on some key metric like trend or momentum. Is that right? Yeah. So it's two things for me. It's got a ranking mechanism and it usually only gets, usually it only gets enters either if I'm, my weekly one only enters on Mondays, my monthly one only enters on the first day of the month kind of thing. So that's the only time. So it also tends to be a lot less, um, 
less trading involved in it. Yes. But yeah, that's the, to me, the key part of rotational is it's only once, once a period that you're right. entering trades. Now, I'm a little bit wishy-washy on the exit, meaning I'm not as hardcore saying, okay, only, only once a period do you exit. Because sometimes mm -hmm. I'll do, I'll trail like profit target or, or um, stop losses or profit targets, which maybe hit in between periods. Gotcha. Yep. Cool. Um, what do you think? So out of all of those, I mean, if we're thinking about maybe the new quant trader, the new, you know, rules-based trader that's coming in, excited about this world, likes what you're saying. I mean, which of those strategies do you think is maybe the easiest to onboard into? Um, actually, that really depends on the person because okay. I know, especially, I mean, I'll, I'll break it up between two, between breakouts and, uh, and mean reversion. Those two are very different gut-wise, especially as a beginning trader, you're going to be looking at a lot of charts. And depending on who you are, buying a breakout might be like, oh my, because I, I remember when I first started buying breakouts, it was like, I can't believe I'm buying this stock. This stock is going to pull, back. there's no <laughs> way. I can't buy this stock. It's, you know, whatever. And I'm like, oh God, just push the button. The you know, back yeah. testing stuff, you know, so I know for me, it was really <laughs> hard because that's the way it was. Mean reversion a stock could be down 20% today. It's like, yeah, yeah, buy the stock kind of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, no problems. And, and for other people, it's different. So a lot of it would be, and I tell people who are looking at this and doing it new is look at the charts. Could you visualize yourself pushing the button to say, yes, let me execute this? Because some of them will, some people will say, oh, I can't do that. That doesn't look right to me. I want, and that, the biggest reason system people are, biggest reasons people fail in systematic trading, in my opinion, at the beginning, is they don't follow their strategy mm. because all strategies will go through a drawdown. And no matter how small that is, I see so many people falter of like, oh my goodness, it's lost three trades in a row. It's broken. I can't follow it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's the hardest part. And so you, being able to continue trading is the thing that's most important at that point. So that's why I think, you know, each trader needs to look at those different methods and see which one rings more true to them. I think that's a really good point because I think especially, you know, when we do these fully rules based strategies, they they look great on paper and you can look at your spreadsheet and be like, oh yeah, like those are the trades. I can totally do this. But when you're in when you actually have to now go through the process of seeing your your order go out to the market to buy some stock that is getting obliterated and you have to you have to now come in and buy that thing, it can be a really tough gut check for yep. For someone to go through and i you know was going to talk about um stop losses and and mean reversion so you again like you gave us earlier you kind of came in as the as the mean reversion king and you've sort of spread out to some other strategies but stop losses and mean reversion are kind of a difficult it's kind of oil and water right is yes. have you found anything different there in terms of making them work in recent research or is it still difficult it, it, it's, I mean, it's really funny. Uh, one, one of the first early projects I did with Larry Connors is we were, doing, we were working on a mean reversion and he said, Hey, put a stop loss in. And, you know, I put the stop loss in, you know, I don't remember what it was, maybe something like 10% stop loss. And then I got curious. It's like, Oh, let me try a 15%. And it's like, wow, the numbers got better. And I just kept cranking the numbers up until <laughs> I was like up to like 60% stop loss. I'm going, let me just take the stop loss out. I was like, Holy crap. It just works better with no stop loss. I mean, even he was surprised. You know, we were both thoroughly surprised by that discovery. Um, so it's still true nowadays. Stop losses will make your mean reversion strategy not as good. Um, now, I do my mean reversion strategies. I do have a stop loss. It's like 30%. So it's not a real stop loss in the sense of it's more of a, it's a what I call a keep me trading the strategy rule. You know, <laughs> there's a point where you just don't, you don't want to see that huge loss. You know, I've had things just tank and keep tanking and keep tanking and not bounce. And it's just psychologically really hard. So at 30%, it's like, you know what? You're just getting out of my portfolio. I don't want to see you anymore. Um, I know it's not the best. I know I can eke out a little bit better. But again, the biggest reason most people fail at this is not following their strategy. So I will often have rules that will keep me, that I know make the strategy worse but keep me trading the strategy, which is even more important. Yeah, I, I love the distinction. I think it's so powerful. I mean, that that message, though, of of these these little hacks, maybe, I mean, we can call it a hack. I mean, it's, it's a rule that you've implemented that you're accepting up front is like, you know what, this is actually going to get me slightly less total returns, but it's yes. going to help me act in a good 
you know, responsible yes. way. And that's worth it. Yes, exactly. You know, I'm, you know, it's not like it's killing my draw, my returns in half. You know, it, it's gave maybe a 10% re- reduction in returns or, you know, it's, it's having a small negative impact. But like I said, I know that psychologically it will help me keep trading. Yeah. Yeah. How much time do you spend reviewing your, your current strategies, your current systems? How much time per week, per month, per year? How do you, how do you break it out? Um, I review my strategies quarterly. I, so I'll take a look at them. Uh, I trade uh, a stable of, um, I trade a, you know, a amount of strategies. I look at them quarterly, mostly to see, you know, how, how, how they've been behaving over the last year. Given the current market conditions, are they behaving the way I expect them to be behaving? Are they not behaving in the way I expect them to be behaving? I mean, and it could be as simple or not simple, but it can be, hey, given the last year, even though the strategy has made money, it's not made it mount as, money, as much money as I would expect given the market conditions. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that a strategy is losing money. It's just not behaving sure. in the way I would expect given the market conditions over the last, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months kind of things like that. So, yeah, I do. Uh, like I said, I do a quarterly review on my strategies like that. And another 10 days, I'll be doing it again, end of each quarter. Nice. I like that routine. And then when you're going through that process, are you, are you potentially adjusting any parameters at all? Like, are you enhancing anything, adding filters no. or you're not doing any of that? You're potentially going to replace it if anything, is that how it works? Yes. Um, I may potentially be replacing it. Um, if I'm if it's just not looking right, I may replace it, uh, take it out of, you know, put it on hold for a while. I, I, I really try really, really hard not to tweak a strategy once mm. it's done, uh, unless I see it behaving in a way that I did, that was not the way I meant it to behave. So maybe Got a strategy it. is being more volatile than I, ex- you know, this usually happens on a newer strategy. So if it's just being more volatile than I want or less volatile than I want, you know, it's being, you know, less volatile than I want or whatever, then I may tweak it. But once it's probably gone past a year, definitely two, I just leave it alone. You know, it's either, yeah, you, you're doing fine or you're not. Um, I may sometimes play around with parameters just to see, is it just the set of parameters that I have that's doing poorly and some slightly different set is doing fine? So maybe it's not the strategy that's doing poorly. It's just a matter of bad luck with the current set of parameters. But again, it's not like I would change the parameters and say, oh, yeah, change it to a, you know, a 19 and a 20, you know, from a 19th parameter to a 20 parameter or, you know, change this parameter. Okay, I'm going to do these now. Um, like I said, I try, because what happens is normally you want to tweak those parameters after some bad event has happened to your strategy. So you're trying, you're emotionally responding to something in the market. And that's usually not a good time to be making changes. And usually I now have a rule that's like, okay, if I want to make a change that I'm emotionally responding to, I can make the change on paper, but then I've got to wait three months before I implement it. And mm-hmm. usually three months later, I completely forgot about, oh yeah, I wanted to change it and I keep whatever I'm, I'm trading kind of thing. I love that. That's a really good little, uh, yeah, it's a good seasoned hack there. And it's, I mean, you, you could just imagine last, you know, COVID or what was it? Uh, March of, of 2020, right? Where we right. were all of a sudden, we could, we could all stitch in these filters that are going to help us, you know, avoid and sidestep this, this, exogenous event, but, but then we're going down this path that probably is going to make our systems more brittle and, and, and so on and so forth. So I like that a lot. I like that rule of, of kind of sitting on it, making it on paper and then kind of just watching it. So do you, um, do you do any, have you done work on seasonality or have you incorporated any seasonality type of, uh, strategies or filters? I have not done that. A lot of that is mostly because I don't think there's just I don't feel like there's enough data for me to feel mm-hmm. comfortable to make any seasonality changes or, um, and even if you, you can say, well, you could go back 20, 40 years. My, my issues with going back that far tends to be, those markets are very different from I had, even 10 years ago. The markets from 10 years ago are very different from the markets today. The markets mm-hmm. from 20 years ago are very different from today. So I, I just, to me, it's just not enough data to kind of say, okay, yeah, let me, you know, let me use seasonality in a way that I can take advantage of. Got it. Yeah. And I noticed, so you do a lot of work on daily timeframes or even like you say, the weekly rotationals or monthly rotationals. Do you leave out 
or do you not go after the intraday trading strategies because it's harder to come up with edges or is it a data thing or is it something else on intraday strategies? Uh, it is, uh, yes, yes, and something else. Okay. Um, so <laughs> A, getting data is hard and expensive and you can't, well, let me rephrase before I said I can't. Getting delisted stock intraday data is really expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a data issue. Uh, two, uh, it is, I believe the edges are, you're, you're competing against the robots and a whole bunch of, it's just gotten much more sophisticated than it was 15 years ago. So your edges are much smaller, execution becomes much more critical. And C, the other is, well, like I said, I don't, I don't want to be tied to the markets that closely because now, yeah. you know, even if you automate stuff like that, you still have to babysit the computer. You know, sure. you just don't know when the computer's going to crash, you get a power hiccup. I've heard too many horror stories happen for people who do intraday trading fully automated to know, yeah, you, you may be just sitting there surfing the web, but you still got to be sitting in front of the computer just in case something goes wrong kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, those yeah. are the reasons why I'm not there. Yeah. Makes total sense to me. So if we are trying to think about maybe the, the, the new trader who wants to get started as, as a systems trader, they're listening to this and saying, you know, I really like this approach. It makes sense to me. I guess the elephant in the room is uh, they have to be able to code. Is that, you know, what you feel too? Is there a way to sort of easily go about this without knowing how to code or any other ways you could sort of tip someone that's new into this quant side of trading? Yeah, it is really, it's really hard to do without coding. I mean, yeah, there are certain platforms out there that let you test what I call simple ideas, but most people quickly grow out of them, you know, yeah. as they want to add, you know, some basic complexity to the strategy. Um, you know, if you're, you know, part of it depends on how much capital you have. You know, you, if you don't have much much capital, then you're gonna have to spend the time to learn the code. Um, yeah. If you've got enough capital, then you do what a lot of clients they come to me. You know, they realize it's, it's a lot cheaper to pay me than them to try to figure it out and you know and learn how to code and do all this stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it is it is it is tough without knowing a little you know without knowing coding or having a big enough capital base to be able to pay somebody else to code it up for you. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Cesar does have um, uh, client services where he will code up your strategy. So definitely, if you've got ideas, um, check his website out. We'll put the links in the description here. So as we sort of kind of wind down, um, you alluded to it a little bit. I was going to ask you sort of what you're working on right now, but maybe crypto side, crypto aside, any other just in terms of thinking about the stock market, any other like white whale that you're chasing in terms of a market dynamic of something you're trying to make work? Yeah. So my current, so I, uh, for the one of my longest strategies that I had ever was a short strategy. Um, you know, I, I, there's a short strategy that I was trading for about 10 years. And then about now, what, two, three years ago, it broke. You know, it was one of those, one of my reviews is like something is just off on the strategy. And, you know, when I looked at it, you know, like a year later, it was like, oh, my God, something fundamentally changed somewhere because what was once a beautiful equity curve and became a horrendous equity curve. And mm. So I'm trying again to find a short strategy. Um, I'm having no success at this point. Um, I know they exist because I've talked to a couple other researchers who are trading you know, a short strategy. I'm not asking them for their rules. But, you know, I just like, okay, I know that other people are having success. I just have to somehow change my model. Probably the hard part for me is I had a model for a short strategy and I have to break that model and try to find something new. Mm -hmm. So that is where, um, that's my current white well is um, short strategies are very, very, very hard to trade. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I, I like them is because they are just so difficult to trade that I know there aren't a lot of people trading them couple of things come to mind. So, cause I know the other strategy you, you have in the, in the, in the bullpen, one of them is uh, a volatility strategy, which is, you know, obviously it's not shorting stocks, but it, but it, it gets you a little bit of that dimension, right? Though, if, yes. you're, if you're long VIX and it, it can be a sort of a hedge, is that something you're still trading in nowadays? Yeah, it, it's definitely in the bullpen, but I'm okay. looking more specifically to a stock trading uh, strategy because yeah. that tends to be that was more 
in the market almost all the time kind of thing. Gotcha. It was, you know, you strong bull markets, bear markets. It was in the market. There was no kind of regime filter for that strategy. It was like, yeah, get me in, get me short. Uh, but like I said, it just something snapped on it two or three years ago. And, gotcha. you know, lately that's been the thing I, I've been trying to come back to and trying to focus on. Yeah. Short, shorting. And especially in the last 10 years or so, I mean, it's just, it, yeah, it's tough, but yeah, it's super, you know, lucrative and helpful to a portfolio. Again, when we think of that conversation of adding a building block in, it just changes, it just helps so much. And then on the crypto side. So I have to ask as someone who, so this is a space I've been exploring for, for a while now too. And I've got, um, lots of promising ideas that I am sort of eking out to, to put into production as well. Um, but one of the things that sort of drives me nuts, because like yourself, I like simplicity. I like only having to go to the, you know, to the to the to the keyboard to put in some orders once a day. Crypto is twenty four seven. Are you taking a similar approach of 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 daily candle, and that's how you're kind of uh, thinking about this new system as well, like UTC close, and then you're making decisions. So yes, I'm using the daily approach. I'm not going to four hour candles, one hour candles. Mm -hmm. um, I use the UTC close. And basically for my back testing, I'm assuming I get the next day's closing price. You know, that's what I'm kind of, you know. Got it. I'm testing that and I'm also testing the average of the next day's candle. You know, I'm, I'm testing it. those two kind of like, okay, let me use those two as proxies for my price. Do I get results that I like? If so, then okay, then I know the exact fill is not crucially important kind of thing. Um, Got it. But yeah, I mean, it is... It is definitely, if I do start trading it, it's going to be very interesting to see how I handle, you know, knowing that the markets are open while I'm placing the order kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Well, I'm super excited to see what you put together there. I imagine you'll be putting up a blog post or announcing it somewhere on the site when it's, when it's up and live. Uh, probably. Yes. Um, you know, like I said, but it was probably still a couple months out for various reasons, but um, it, it's looking very, very promising. Um, enough so that I'm now, you know, trying to figure out where exactly I want to be trading this strategy and things like that. Awesome. Have you spent time looking at how that's correlated with your equities, equity market stuff, or are you, or are you treating it just totally separate? The, the problem is it's just too short. Of, mm -hmm. I mean, the problem with crypto is really, you really can't start testing it from until about 2018 or so. Yeah. You know, yeah. to get enough because I'm trading for me, I'm trading a basket of crypto. It's not like I'm saying, okay, I'm developing strategy for Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything like that. It's I'm, I'm trading the basket. And, you know, it's, so it's just not enough data, which is going to be the hard part yeah. of pulling the trigger on that just because I know there are so many issues. But, you know, by the time you wait, it may be way, way too late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Excellent. Well, I'm excited for that. Uh, anything? else on your mind or anything we didn't talk about today? Anything that you're working on that you feel we left out? No, I mean, I think we've covered, uh, and, you know, these are all great questions. I, I think this is uh, really nice. And, uh, you know, anybody listening to this, you know, go to my, if you got a question on anything you've heard, you know, feel free. I uh, got to contact me. I'm, you know, I answer everybody's emails, uh, usually within one or two business days. So, you know, I'm always happy to uh, you know answer questions. Cool. And where's the best place they should go to find you? Yeah, I mean, they can go to my Alvarez Quant Trading blog and there's a contact me form there. Uh, or you can, uh, yeah, so that's probably the best place to, to start from. Awesome. Well, we'll put those links in the show notes, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. You can find those show notes at thetraderist.com forward slash podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Hope to see you in the next episode. And Cesar, this was awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to Smarter Trading. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. For all of the show notes, links, and call-outs, head on over to thetraderisk.com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes. Smarter Trading is hosted by me, Evan Medeiros, and produced by Ashton Alexander. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you in the next episode.